Good morning. Good to have you with us again on this June Sunday. It's a beautiful day. We're glad to be together again. We're going through the book of Revelation. And you know, it's just so filled with hope. You know, for the believer, for you and I who know Jesus Christ, His certain end is coming. The kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is coming. You know, whatever we face in our life, that's the promise, though. It always is there in front of us, no matter how difficult it gets, no matter the relationships, the challenges, just the things that we face that are really difficult and hard, challenging uh, for the sake of Christ, just encountering the evil in this world, all of that, just to be reminded and to remember, Jesus is in control. He has a plan. This plan is being fulfilled and laid out before our very eyes here in Revelation. I want you to take courage. I want you to take hope. We are in the book of Revelation, and we're going to be in chapter 12 today. Now, I was in chapter 12 in December the 20th. We did a a Christmas sermon from this text. We saw Jesus Christ from this text. So I'm going to briefly just look at the summary of that so so we can see that piece then being brought together with what we're going to look at today. And so the first part, I just want to summarize for you to bring us all up to speed and kind of give you the big picture here a little bit. What we saw there was simply this, just reminding to us that God's gift, His gift of hope that He's given to us in the Scriptures, it is always portrayed against this backdrop. This backdrop, uh, it's immersed against the reality of conflict, of warfare. That's the context in which we see that gift of hope laid before us. And so that's why it's such an encouragement. Spiritual warfare is a reality. We go back to Genesis 3.15, where sin erupted. The result of that, it brought a schism between man and God, uh, between man's seed and and God's line, which would ultimately bring Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ is portrayed here in this verse as the provision for the penalty of sin. We see here and are reminded that God is, is always good. Against sin, he provides what we need. He provides the blessing. He provides the, the, the provision through Jesus Christ. That's what we see here in the book of Revelation and in Genesis through. And so we focused on Jesus Christ as that perfect gift from Genesis 3.15 all the way through, how God is providing to meet that need, uh, to rectify the sin situation that we find ourselves in. And so we saw elements of that here in Revelation chapter, chapter 12. <clears throat> in verses 1 and 2, we saw the gift of his love. We see it in this reality that that He chooses to love us. Uh, He chooses to to extend His favor when He saves us. That's what God is doing. He is choosing to to bring His blessing into your life. What what an amazing God we have. We see in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter 12, we see a sign. That sign is a woman uh, described here in in many ways. But we, we understood and see clearly that that woman is Israel. And so in the Old Testament, the New Testament, this is this woman is portraying the relationship that God has had with Israel from Genesis all the way through, even to this point in time here. Just and it's that covenant relationship, God's promise to Israel. He's not he has kept his word uh, all the way to the end. He will keep his covenant. We've seen that already here uh, in Revelation. God keeping his covenant promise to Israel. We saw as well the gift of his truth. You know, God tells us the truth. Uh, He tells us here in verse 3 that we face a powerful adversary. And he could have just chose to leave those things beside, uh, off the page. And we'd always been wondering what's going on. He's always told us, been up front, here's your need. Here's the sin issue. Here's the sin problem that you have as mankind. And here's your adversary, what he wants to do in your life, how he wants to wreak havoc in your life. He wants us to know so that we can know the provision in Jesus Christ. And so we see another sign in verse 3. We see a red dragon uh, that just... Uh, connotes uh, power and evil and everything that's a part of that of that image. We saw we see in verse two and verse five the gift of his birth. It's miraculous. It, it is divine. It is only of God. It could have happened no other way. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ. We see a pregnancy, which is Israel's being used of God to bring to bring the Son of God uh, into this world as He takes on flesh, now fully God and now fully man. A male child, specifically in Jesus Christ, we see we see uh, John point that out here in Revelation clearly. It is God's gift, God's gift of salvation to a, to a world that's lost in sin. We see the gift of His promise. He's coming back again one day. He will reign, rule, and reign again. We see that in verse five. He is the one who will rule. He will rule with a rod of iron. He will destroy evil. He will rule all nations. 
that is now on the precipice here of revelation of being fulfilled in this chapter as we move towards the end of the tribulation and into the millennial kingdom. The gift of his assurance. Uh, he, he, he assured us of who he is by victory. When he ascended after the cross, it was victory. Um, his authority, both of these things we see in verse 5. We see a child that's caught up in verse 5. That is the ascension of Jesus Christ. We see now the kingdom has come and the accuser is thrown down. That's victory, folks. And you know, the scriptures are constantly just showing the believer, you and I, the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ. We can count on him. We can put our faith in him. We can trust him with everything that he says. We see the gift of his provision, how he provides uh, for his children. Here specifically, we see divine protection in verse 6. We see that woman that's in verse 1. She has to flee. Israel has to flee for its very life here in the tribulation, the second half of the tribulation. And God prepares a place for, for her, for Israel, so that she'll not be annihilated, she'll not be wiped out. God keeps his covenant promise to Israel. And then finally, we see the gift of his call uh, to every believer. Uh, the faithful choices that are revealed here shows, shows the gift of what we have in Jesus Christ. Verse 17, verse 11, the reality that spiritual warfare, it rages all the time. And yet in that context, uh, we choose because of who we are in Christ. We choose because of what we have in Jesus Christ. We choose based upon his power and his enablement to, uh, to be able to be overcomers in the midst of that. And every day you and I are making choices in Jesus Christ. And we are reflecting the call of Jesus Christ in our life. He's called us to walk faithfully. He's reminded us it'll never be easy. There's always a cost to identifying with Jesus Christ. But he has promised, I'm going to be with you. And so this is kind of in summary what we saw that uh, on that Sunday in December. And it all was uh, this challenge to us that we, would, that we would be called to be set apart so that Christ... Could, so we'd make room in our in our hearts for the Lord Jesus Christ so that he could write what? His story, stamp his story on our hearts, on our lives. You know, once we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, then the story of our life isn't about our dreams and what we hope to become and, and what we've done and, and, uh, and all of these things. That's a part of our story, but our story becomes what Christ has done, what he calls us to, what our hope is in Jesus Christ. What, what the good news is in our relationship with Jesus Christ, what we have in Jesus Christ, that becomes our story. It's Jesus Christ. And so the challenge of realizing that just the blessing of God's gifts through Christ is that now that becomes our life story. Our life story becomes about Jesus Christ. So I want you to take that from, from even this reminder. Go back to that message. Um, Listen to it again. Go back to this text. Read it again. Be reminded of these promises before you. Today I want us to come to the second part. I want us to look at, at this chapter 12 now from another side, the other side of the coin. The first side is, is what we have in Jesus Christ, what he's done for us, what he continues to do for us. And the other side of that coin is, is the adversity that we face and, and the challenge that we face. The second side of the coin here in chapter 12 is, is about Satan, it's about his fall. It's about his wrath. It's about the adversary that we face. We need to be real about that. So let's look at that together. We see here in verse, verse uh, 1, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 star, stars. That takes us back to Genesis 37, verses 9 and following, where, where Joseph had a dream from God that, the, that these elements would bow down to him. Uh, his father rebuked him, but meditated on what he was told. His, his brothers hated him and were jealous of him because visions and dreams from God were significant. And yet, it, yet it, it, it gave us a glimpse all the way, all the way to what we see taking place here now. God's provision for Israel. We see that reality. So what I want to do is I want us to look at uh, Satan and how he's responding to this reality of God's chosen people. Uh, God's plan, God's program, all of that. But well, we see Satan's past in this text, so let's look at that. Um, I'm not going to read it all. We'll read it then. We're going to read portions of it as we go through today. I want us to look at, at verse 4. Uh, we have Satan here. He's cast out of heaven. And so his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven, and he cast them to the earth. 
And so we have we have Satan being being uh, thrown out of heaven here, um, and he takes with him a horde of demons who go with him. This is this is referencing Satan's first fall from heaven. We're going to see this in Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight. We get a real clear glimpse of this. You, Satan, were an anointed guardian cherub. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were blameless in your ways from the day that you were created till until righteous unrighteousness was found in you. And you are filled with violence and you sinned. And so I, God, I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God. And I destroyed you and I cast you to the ground. Satan fell. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 and following speak to this as well. He was filled with pride. He tried to usurp God's place. He and a third of the angels in heaven were thrown out of heaven. This happens before Adam and Eve were even, uh, uh, after they were created sometime in that, in that time, they fell. And they were thrown out of heaven. But he has continued to have access to heaven. We're going to see that in this passage. Verse 4 and 5, we continue as we read. And, um, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth. So when she was born... When, when she bore her child, that he might devour her. And she gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. We see here that he has always sought. He's always sought to prevent and to destroy the Savior. Prevent the Savior from even coming. He would, he would have had Joseph declare Mary an adulteress and had her stoned. That would have stopped it right there. He tried to have Jesus Christ executed, and he was. And yet he didn't lose. He didn't win the battle there. He lost the battle. Jesus ascended in victory, rose from the grave, and ascended in victory. He's always sought to destroy Christ, the work of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's trying to do in your life right now, in my life right now, around the world. That's He still, that's what he wants to do, to destroy the work of Christ in every way that he can. That's what's taking place here in these verses. And he's always hated Israel. He's always hated God's people. Um, verse 6, And the woman the woman fled into the wilderness where she was had a place prepared by God in which she was to be nourished for 1,260 days. This is the second half of that tribulation. The Antichrist comes on the scene. We're going to see that in the next chapter. We've already alluded to that here in Revelation clearly. The Antichrist is going to come in power, and Satan is going to empower him and control him, and he will seek to destroy Israel. And he's trying to destroy the church today. And he's trying to destroy the work of God today around the world. And, and frankly, he's trying to destroy the work of Christ in your life right now. He, would do, he, he will do anything to try to minimize, delegitimize, devalue the work of Jesus Christ in your life. He wants your eyes off of Jesus Christ and not anything else but him. That's what he wants. He's always hated Israel. Well, his future is also declared very clearly here in chapter 12. And so let's look at that. Let's see that. What does he have to say? Well, in verse 3, we see this. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. There's a lot that could be said here about this. Um, reality is this, this shows the immense power that Satan has had and will have. He will, he will harness the nations, ten nations in, in specific, uh, will, will rise up as kings under the Antichrist, under the beast. Three of them will be slain because they will try to rebel or, or whatever it is. They will not please uh, the Antichrist, Satan, and they will be conquered. They will probably seek to usurp the Antichrists. So three of those ten will be destroyed. But he will uh, commandeer a, a formidable army. He will control the armies of the world here in the second half of the Re of Revelation. And uh, folks, that's powerful on this earth, and he will have that. We're going to speak to that in just a second. Now remember, in verse 9, we see another element here. Let's look at verse 9. And that great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown with him. We see the reality here that Satan is now in the second half of the tribulation. He's going to be thrown out of heaven. Uh, in fact, let's just read the context here. Verse 7. A war arose in, in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven, and he was thrown down. 
And so a war erupts here in heaven. There, we're going to see that in just a second. But the, what, the, what I want you to focus on right now is Satan is thrown out of heaven. Now, he said, well, he was thrown out of heaven in, in, in Genesis. He was thrown out of heaven before. He was, but he's had, he's had continual, constant access to heaven. Um, he's in heaven now, most likely. He's in heaven all the time. We're going to see what he's doing in just a second. Um, he will be thrown out of heaven here for good. He will, he will lose access to all of heaven. And every demon who has any access in heaven will also lose access to heaven. There will, there will be no demonic presence in heaven of any kind that ceases here because victory is being won. The victory at the cross is now being realized. We see that reality taking place. He'll be thrown out and he will be humiliated. Look at verses 10, 11, and 12. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Oh, but they have conquered him by their blood, the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives, even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. He's thrown out of heaven. What happens as he's thrown out of heaven? Heaven, heaven absolutely rejoices. All the martyred saints to this point who have given their lives, the church, uh, the, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, all of those are, are exalting Jesus Christ because victory is now being realized. The seventh trumpet has blasted. We're going to see the result of that in another chapter or two. And, and heaven is erupting because Satan has been thrown out of heaven. That's the reality. And he is him humiliated at the joy at his defeat in heaven. He has had access to heaven since he was thrown out. Folks, that's going to change. It's going to stop. So what is he going to do? He's going to seek to annihilate Israel, but he's going to fail. That's what he's going to do. We see that in verse 6. We see that in verses 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to heaven, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And that's Israel. And the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. We see here, as he's thrown to earth, his focus turns from, from battle in heaven. His focus turns from, well, look at, look, at, um, look at verse 10 at the end of verse 10. He's in heaven and he accuses you and I day and night. You want to know what he's doing in heaven? That's what he's doing. He's taking advantage of your sin and my sin, your weakness and my sin. He's constantly bringing that to Jesus Christ, to the Father. He's constantly seeking to trip up what Jesus Christ has done at the cross. He's constantly seeking to undermine, to accuse you and I of not being real and genuine because, because, because of the sin that's still in our life and the way that we struggle. And he knows the struggles that we have and he holds it against us. And Jesus Christ stands there, covers us by his blood, the work that he did. He's thrown out of heaven and he's humiliated and he turns his wrath to Israel. We see that here. Not only that, but we see in verse 17, he will pursue God's people. And then the dragon becomes furious. Because what happens in these verses 13, 14, 15, 16? He goes after Israel. Here we have, here we have symbology. We have picture. Uh, um, and he, seeks, he brings every resource at his disposal to swallow up Israel, to destroy her, to flood her so that she's overwhelmed and annihilated. God protects her. And he opens up the earth, as it were, and he swallows, and, and that evil dissipates, its impact dissipates before it gets to Israel and, and annihilates her, which is his purpose. And he takes her to a place which is prepared just for her, and he watches over her. But verse 17 says, and so he's furious with the woman, and so he goes off to make war on the rest of her offspring, Jews who are being saved and 
Gentiles who are also being saved. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, and he stood on the sand of the sea. That last expression, that last phrase, as he comes down, he has no access in heaven anymore, and, he's, and he plants his, he digs his heels in on planet Earth. This will be his final battleground. This will be his final place, and he's going to take it out on the on the people of Earth, the unsaved, and but here especially the saved, Israel's chosen as a chosen nation and God's people as chosen people. He hates you now like that. He hates me now like that. He hates every Christian. He will have power then that he doesn't even have now, even though he is extremely powerful and dangerous to you and to I right now. He will have power then that is beyond description. He is allowed to exercise. But verse 5 shows us he will be defeated by Jesus Christ. So Israel gives birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. See, that day's coming. It's a promise from Jesus Christ. It's a promise from the Father. Jesus is going to rule and reign. He will bring the world under his dominion, under his domination. Satan will be defeated. Let's look at the character of Satan, who he is, why he does all this. What's, what's driving him? What drives him? You know, the thing is, Satan knows he's going to lose. He knows the end is coming. He's keenly aware of that. Why doesn't he just give up? He's going to take out as many as he can. He's going to bring as much destruction as he can. Somewhere deep within him is the hope that he will usurp still the authority and the reign of Christ. Here's what he knows. Matthew chapter 8. Two demons cry out, What have you to do with us when they encounter Jesus Christ? What do you have to do with us? Oh, Son of God, they know Jesus Christ, who he is. He's the Son of God. What do you have to do with us? Have you come here to torment us, what, before the time? All the demons know, Satan knows, that his end is torment. His end is a place of torment. These who are followers of Satan have given their allegiance to Satan. They know what Satan knows. They know that this day is coming. It's not our time, they cry. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, this chapter. The devil knows that his time is short. And he's doing everything he can to take advantage of that time and to destroy this world. When God created the heavens and the earth and, and put man, Adam and Eve, in dominion over mankind, Satan has been seeking to destroy that dominion ever since. He thought he won, but Jesus Christ re reclaimed that dominion for man at the cross. And it will come into effect when he wins the battle and the victory here at the end of the tribulation. What's his character? He's powerful. We saw that in verse 3. Seven heads, a great dragon, ten horns, his head, seven diadems. We'll look at this in association with the beast later. Uh, he will have world dominion. He is powerful, he is powerful, he is powerful. Folks, he is powerful today. There is no one in your life who is more dangerous than he is. There's only one Satan, yet he harnesses his demonic forces. He harnesses this world and his hatred of God. He harnesses the sin that's in your heart and in my heart. And for the believer, holds them in bondage. For the, I mean, for the unbeliever who, that holds them in bondage, for the believer still plagues us every day. He harnesses all those things. Folks, he's powerful. Never forget that. Daniel chapter 7, As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall rise, another shall arise after them, and shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down the three kings. That's where we get that. Three, three of the ten nations that will rise to the cream of the, of the cream, of the, cream of the top of, of dominion and power during the tribulation will be destroyed because they will most likely rebel against the Antichrist. Revelation 13, here we have what we just read. He is powerful and he is rebellious. He challenges God, verse 4. His tail sweeps down a third of the stores, stars because of sin in his heart, the violence in his heart. He tries to usurp God. He's rebelled ever since. He is, he is the father of rebellion. That's who he is. He's constantly challenging God. He will challenge God in your life. He will challenge God every day because of your sin and mine. 
He is a murderer. He has tried in verse 4. We see that. He stood, the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore the child, he might devour it. He did everything he could to prevent the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He would have destroyed that baby Jesus at the very beginning if he could. He could not. He's a murderer. He continues to be a murderer. He tried here. Every day he murders. People that die and are killed and are murdered and slaughtered because, because they, that work is of the hit the father of the devil. And he fails. He's failed to, to murder Jesus Christ. But he brings that cancerous perspective of people into the world today. He is relentless. Verse 6 and following, we saw that. He is relentless after Israel. He will go after Israel. He will do everything he can in the tribulation to destroy her once and for all. Israel has been the object of hatred its entire existence. He's relentless after you and I. Zechariah chapter 13, even though God says he prepares a place for them, we see here in Revelation 13, this is the reality of what Zechariah says. In the whole land in Israel, says the Lord, two, this is speaking to this time here, two-thirds of Israel will be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. Do you understand what he's saying here? Prophetically, we're getting a picture during the tribulation, two-thirds of Israel is going to be wiped out. But yet Satan still is not victorious. He is defeated. His goal is to wipe out Israel completely. His goal is to wipe out every believer completely. God will preserve. It says, I will put the, the remaining third, this third, into the fire, refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested, and they will call on my name, and I will answer them. And I will say, they, they, these who have been faithful. These are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. He wants you and I to say that too. So they're facing judgment from God here in the tribulation. Israel is. And they're facing attacks from Satan. At that time, Daniel 12 says, shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. There shall be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation until that time. But God's going to deliver those whose names are written ultimately here we see in the book of life. That's what we see. In fact, in verse 7, there wrote, war rose in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels. Michael is, is a counterpart to Satan. It seems not as powerful as Satan when he's called in Jude to to fight Satan, he rebukes him in the name of the Lord, not his own name. Here we have Michael preserving and protecting Israel, though, in the name and in the power of the Lord. Satan is attacking. Folks, think about it. Israel is being judged by, by God and being attacked by Satan. This is going to be the worst time in Israel's history. It will be worse than all the persecution Israel has ever endured. endured. In captivities, the Holocaust is nothing compared to what we're going to see here. Think about that. And yet, God is going to preserve a special chosen group who will, who will call upon Him and receive Him as Savior, and He will be faithful to His promise. Satan's character, he is constantly in conflict. He's constantly at war. At war. war breaks out in heaven, we see here in verse 7. He's constantly, when there's conflict, if there's conflict in your life, conflict between people, conflict in the church, conflict in the community, conflict in the nations, it is because ultimately it comes from the sin that has been spawned. It is because Satan is at work. He is the father of conflict. He is the father of war. That's the reality of it. Verse 9, he is a serpent. He is a serpent. Look at that. Uh, he is a deceiver, as we saw in in. Genesis chapter 2 and 3. He is deadly. Sin is the result of his deception, folks. Any lie that he brings into your path, as you and I believe that, the result is only destruction. All that this culture is laying before us that we need to be following and believing and doing and that we need to be living this way and live, living this way and accepting this lifestyle and this sin, it's all deception. He is deceiving the world into thinking that's the way we should go. Folks, we need to have our, our minds, our hearts in the Word of God. So we're protected by his truth. He is deadly. He is a deceiver. And he's working constantly to deceive, to deceive you and to deceive me. He is the devil. He is the accuser. He slanders you and I continually. He accuses you and I continually. We see that in verse 9 and 10. Right now, day and night, he's in heaven. 
Oh, he may come to earth, but he is in heaven constantly, it says day and night in those verses. Not only to accuse you and I, but to know what God's doing and to act without knowledge against us. He will do all that he can. He will use all the information that he has to his advantage. His name is Satan, which simply means he is our enemy. He is our adversary. He is formidable. Never fight Satan. Never never address him on your own, in your own strength. He is filled with wrath, verse 12. Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devils come down to you in great wrath. Our culture is merging out of control. Emotions rule the day. Whatever I feel, I vent. Anger, wrath, rioting, it is, the, it is the name of the day. And that is all reflective of Satan at work. And he is a hater of Christ, and he is a hater of God's people, verse 17. Why does he hate you and I so much? Well, his hatred is very specific. It is on a very specific group, verse 17. It is on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. His hatred is very specific. He hates those, right here, he hates those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, his hatred has always been focused against these two things. Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ, at the cross, in your life at salvation, in your life going forward, at the work of God's word in your life. He hates God's Word, its power, its living ability to transform because it represents and flows from the living Word, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He hates those things, folks, and He will do anything to undermine and destroy what God is trying to do. This is the focus of His hatred. You need to know that. Chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 2. John himself bore witness, in other words, he was a martyr, for the cause to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. His life's focus was this. It was the word of God, which he wrote, had a part in writing. What a blessing. But he stood for that word. He stood on the truth of God's word. He did not compromise. He would not devalue God's word. He honored God's word. He exalted God's word because it spoke of his Savior. It spoke of God Almighty. And he honored and identified with Jesus Christ no matter the cost. In fact, verse 9 of chapter 1 in this great book, John says, I'm your brother. I'm your brother in tribulation and the kingdom and in patient endurance. And all of this is in Jesus Christ. I'm on Patmos. Why? Because of the word of God, my commitment to the word of God and my commitment to the, to the name of Jesus Christ, to my testimony of Jesus Christ to the mark of Jesus Christ in my life, to those two things I'm committed. God wants you committed to those very two things in your life more than anything else. He wants your marriage to reflect this. He wants you at your work, job, and vocation, life's work to reflect this. He wants you in your relationships to reflect this. He wants the Word of God to be stamped on your life he wants the character and the person of Jesus Christ to be stamped on your life. He wants you and I to identify with him, our lives with him, no matter the cost. John says, I understand that cost. John says, I know. I'm living it out right here. I'm exiled on a terrible island by where I cannot get off because of my association, my commitment to Jesus Christ. In the Word of God. Revelation 6, verse 9. The martyrs, the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Why? Why are Christians being slain in the tribulation? Because they recognize and they understand and they are standing upon these two truths, the Word of God and the witness that they had borne. What is that witness? That witness is Jesus Christ. Folks, your life and my life need to be clear on that now. Not only is it needful and necessary for a clear testimony to people who need the Lord, it is an affirmation or a lack of affirmation in your life as to whether you are a genuine believer, follower of Jesus Christ or not. 
Are you and I committed to the Word of God and what it says in our life and to following Jesus Christ? Matthew chapter 19, verse 10, even the angels, John bowed down before an angel. He says, oh no, don't you ever do that. He says, I'm a servant. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who what? Hold to the testimony of Christ. Even angels understand the unique connection that we have with Jesus Christ that they don't have. Because we are in Jesus Christ by faith. We are children of God. Worship God. Revelation 20. Saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. They didn't worship the beast. They didn't accept the mark of the beast. They rejected that. They refused that. They would not be identified. Are there things in your life from this culture you say, I will not identify with that. I will not be identified with this worldview. I will not be identified with the sin in the culture. I will not accept the sin. It is contrary to the word of God and to what his desire is for my life as a living testimony. And the promise to all of us, we will reign with Jesus Christ. That is the promise. How do we have this foundation? That's the challenge at the end of this chapter. Satan is wicked. He's powerful. He's deadly. Not just in the tribulation, folks. He's, he's wicked. He's terrible. He's deadly. How? He's after you and he's after me. He's after your children, your grandchildren. He is undermining Christ in their life. The schools they are going to are undermining the values of Jesus Christ. You need to know that. You need, to be, you need to be engaging them for Jesus Christ at home so that they are prepared and equipped to handle what they're going to face in this world. That's a challenge, but it can be done. You and I need to accept that challenge. So how do we have this foundation? These two things, these two elements in our life, how do we do that? Very familiar. But folks, it's not the familiarity that matters. It's, it's the way it's lived out in our life. One passage, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his life. Jesus Christ wants to be strong in your life. He's your power. He's mine. We need to let Jesus Christ be strong in our life. Is he strong in your life right now? Right now, this week, has he been strong in your life? Is he your strength? Is there, is there identifiable strength of Jesus Christ in your life right now? Are you yielding to him? Are you and I, are we willing to let go so that he can have control? The way to have this foundation in our life is to let him be the strength. We're, we're weak. We must let him be the strength in our life. Write down on a piece of paper, how is Jesus Christ strong in my life? My testimony my commitment. How is he strong in those things right now? Verse 11. Put on. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You and I need not only to, be, to let him be the strength in our life. We need to be trained. We need to be ready in our life. We're not to, we're not to minimize. We're not to devalue any part of God's word. It's, it's the whole counsel of God. It's the whole armor of God. We've got to put on the whole armor of God. You know, it's amazing how many believers simply ignore whole sections of God's Word and never read it. If I never read portions of God's Word, I, I leave myself unequipped, unable to be ready, to be skilled in the use of God's Word, to understand what God has done throughout history, what He desires to do, what He wants to do through me. And so I have to be careful not to shut out truth from God's Word. Sometimes we have a, we have a tendency, if, if, if we have sin in our life or a pattern in our life or a tendency in our life that we know is not, doesn't honor God, we ignore certain areas of Scripture or, or certain truths from God's Word. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to be exposed to that. Folks, we are setting ourselves up for danger. We need to, we need to, we need to uh, immerse ourselves in the Word of God. And simply come to the Word of God and say, Lord, what do you need to show me? What do I need to see today so that I, my testimony will reflect to you? God, what needs to change in my life so that you are the one who is viewed and seen and understood from my life testimony? That my life is about you. The story of my life is about you. 
We need to be trained. We need to be ready. We need to know how to read the Word of God, understand the Word of God, learn from the Word of God, read a passage, read a verse, and learn how to understand what it means in the context of the Word of God and what it means for my life and how to put it into use. The church is there to help you. Colleges are there to help you. Other people are there to help you. But you and I must desire that and want that. Verse 12. Why? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and powers, and darkness, and spiritual forces, and evil in the heavenly places. See, we do wrestle. We do struggle. If you're going to be firm and have this firm foundation in your life and my life, I've got to be real about the weaknesses in my life. I've got to be honest about the weaknesses in my life. Folks, I have, I have weaknesses in my life. If I'm not honest about those things, I'm vulnerable. Folks, if I'm not honest about those things in my life, I'm going to fall, and it's going to be tragic. What about your life? What's continually coming up in your life that's a challenge to you as to how you operate? What is it that, that you tend to hear from other people about your life that needs to change? Have you listened? Do you listen to others? Do you listen to the Word of God? You know when the Spirit of God convicts your heart and touches your heart and tries to prompt you towards Jesus Christ, towards that great love of Jesus Christ and love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your might, all your mind, and then to love, love and love your neighbor as yourself, and to love your neighbor as you love Jesus Christ? Folks, unless the Word of God is pouring into my, into my life, there's weaknesses. Sin just just creates weakness in my ability to carry these things out. I can't do it. I need the Spirit of God controlling me. I need, the, I need the character of Jesus Christ operating in my life so that my weakness, when it's surrendered to Jesus Christ, it becomes strength, His strength, in my life. I want that for you. I want that for me. Verse 13. So take up, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... You and I need to be willing to take the necessary steps to having done all. Folks, you just got to go after it. You have to want it. It has to be the passion of your heart and your life. It's not about you making it happen, but it's about you desiring it. It's about you wanting it. It's about you taking the steps necessary for it to take place. Being in the Word of God. Folks, you got to, you and I, we must read the Word of God and must desire it. We must desire for it to change me. It must be sweet to our life. The Word of God. And so identify. Identify the steps that, that we need to take in our life so that this foundation can be ours. And identify areas where I need to grow in being faithful. That's what we need to do. This is what we want, verse 11. This is the key. And they have conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. The key to every believer who has ever lived is simply this reflection right here. My life is Christ. I live in Christ. I live for Jesus Christ. Not I, but Jesus Christ. Lord, help me. And every day I wake up and say, Lord, help me. And Lord, use me for your glory and for your honor. That that's, must be the call of our heart. Our testimony must be Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, in a world that needs a Savior and needs grace. This is a call to you to wake up. It's a call to you to be intentional. It's a call to you and I to be committed to Jesus Christ, to the Word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ. May the Spirit of God continue to impress that on your heart and my heart as well. And use revelation in this way for us today. We have an adversary that's strong. We have a Savior who is stronger. Take that challenge with you and grow and change. We invite you to come back next week. We're going to continue. We're going to look at the Antichrist. There's much to see. May we continue to just be, be shaped by the Word of God as we respond and live today. Thanks again for joining with us.